This episode covers a span of time between 260 to 251 million years ago, to the very end of the Permian period. Now, the world of the Permian was not like the world that we know or that the dinosaurs knew. Although Eurypterids and Nautiloids weren't as big as they were in previous periods, they still existed. And there's not as many trilobites as there used to be, but they're still out there in the Permian. And all the vertebrates are so weird, they look like something out of Star Wars. The Permian is my favorite period of geologic history for the same reason that Iceland is my favorite country. It's like an alien world, so different than what we're used to. All the continents were merged into a single supercontinent. Imagine what that looked like from space, because if this is the shape of the Earth today, then what did it look like when all the continents were combined on one side? And that also meant that every species on that continent could have traveled all over it. And people didn't figure out tectonic plate movement until the 20th century, and one way they did that was to explain how they were finding the same species from one fossil period on every continent at once. For the last few episodes, we talked about the evolution of mammalian traits arising in synapsids through pelicosaurs, phenacodonts, therapsids, and theriodonts in succession, and we're going to continue that study through the next clade of cynodonts. The crown of Cynodontia is represented by Procyonosuchus. Notice that the ribs are still reptilian. They don't wrap all the way around the chest and they continue all the way to the pelvis, although the last ribs are reduced as they were in previous therapsids. Procyonosuchus essentially means proto-dog crocodile. Now, maybe the skeleton looked like that, but once you put flesh on the bones, it's really not that horrible. Asynodonts were also trending smaller than their terrifying theriodont forerunners. Evolution doesn't always mean getting bigger and better. These things are getting smaller and better. Their ancestors were like big dogs, and these are like smaller dogs. In previous episodes, we showed how mammal-like reptiles began as freaks, and then became monstrous freaks, and then monstrous killers. But we're much better now. That was the old us. We're not like that anymore. We'll be much better this time, honey, I swear. This rendering would look more reptilian if it didn't have that nose. However, there is some evidence to back that. The muzzles of many later theriodonts became sculptured in such a way as to indicate much more vascularity under the skin, implying glands, which in turn implies both hair and at least the possibility of nose leather or a rhinarium like a dog has. There are also subtle indications that some theriodonts even had whiskers. So it probably did look a bit dog-like, but the tail is reduced to the point that it's much too short and spindly to fairly call this a dogodile or a crocodog. Uh, cynodonts were still plantigrade like reptiles, meaning that they walked on their whole foot like bears do instead of up on their toes like dogs do. And these legs may seem splayed out for a modern mammal, but they're not as sprawled out as they are in reptiles. These legs support the weight better and hold the body up higher than reptiles. That and the forward orientation of the feet gave it a more mammal-like gait rather than the side-to-side -side serpentine swagger of reptiles. But their feet were more advanced than reptiles because they had an actual bony heel to launch them on takeoff. Otherwise, they were still pentadactyl, still had all five toes on all four extremities. And what really stands out from this angle is that they didn't have external ears. Mammalian ears are evolving in this animal, as they were in theriodonts and therapsids before them. We're not going to talk about that yet, though. Not until that process is complete in the next couple of episodes, I think. For right now, all I'll mention is while reptiles have a handful of different bones that make up their lower jaw, the lesser bones have diminished and moved out, leaving our ancestors with a jaw made of just one solid piece. The next clade is the more advanced or better developed epicynodonts. These have a number of developments, including more mammal-like cheek teeth. And just as a new clade is identified by all its ancestral traits plus a new addition, it can also be all of their ancestral traits plus the loss of one, too. And looking at the skeleton of Gallosaurus, for example, notice how the lumbar ribs have reduced so much they're not really even ribs anymore. The rib cage doesn't continue from the front legs all the way to the back legs anymore. The loss of abdominal ribs effectively divides the trunk into thoracic and lumbar sections and allows for a diaphragm, which enables the animals to breathe more effectively even while running. Reptiles may be capable of enormous power, but only in short bursts, where our ancestors had greater endurance. The other trait that was lost was a third eye. You may not have noticed, but Procyonosuchus had three eyes, as did many of its ancestors in the last few episodes, and every lizard you've ever seen. But you can't see that third eye because it's much smaller and looks very different. If you look very closely at the top of a lizard's head, you notice that one scale in the center, between and behind its binocular eyes, may be a slightly different color than all the scales around it. 
This is the lens of a parietal foramen, or pineal eye. It's only capable of seeing light and dark, and cold-blooded reptiles use this to assist in regulating body temperature. But since cynodonts were warm-blooded, that third eye lost its necessity, and eventually the skull grew over the hole that it used to see through. And the way that these animals warm their bodies comes at a cost. They have a lot more sustained energy than cold-blooded animals, but it takes a lot of energy to maintain that, too. It's like some old computers could run on 64 megs of RAM, but not the new ones. It takes more to do more, and that costs more. Endothermic animals have a much higher metabolism, so they have to eat more, a lot more. As some lizards and snakes can get away with eating only once a month or so, crocodiles can live for a year without any food at all and usually only eat about once a week or so. But if endothermic animals went a week without food, they'd be starving, a month without, and most of them would be dead. Warm-blooded animals prefer to eat daily, sometimes all day, especially in the case of birds. There's an old saying that she eats like a bird, meaning that she doesn't eat very much. But actually, birds eat a lot because they have a very high metabolism. Mammals, too, will eat a few meals a day, or at least once a day. Lions and tigers, for example, will eat an average of 25 pounds of meat a day. And they can't go for a year between meals like crocodiles can. And large reptiles are better able to retain their body heat. The smaller ones lose it quicker and have to sun themselves more often. But epicynodonts were getting progressively smaller even with higher energy consumption. And this implies that they had insulation to keep the heat in. There was already some indication of whiskers in theriodonts, but what about fur? There's no way the skeleton could show evidence of fur, and hair doesn't usually fossilize. Even if it did, it'd be hard to recognize it. But feces fossilize, and studies of petrified poop reveal that at least some cynodonts had started growing hair. Which means, we went from this horrific monsters in the last couple episodes almost abruptly to things that look more like this. Oh. And look how your mammalian conditioning has taken over. I guess substance isn't important, is it? It's all how you dress it up, right? Put a little fur on it and those saber teeth suddenly don't even matter. You still want to hold it close and nuzzle it with your face. There's an old Star Trek episode where everyone falls in love with these useless hairballs. They don't even know what it is, but it's warm and fuzzy and everyone wants to cuddle them. But you've also seen hairless cats, and they're all rancid looking. The only reason we touch cats is because they're fluffy. So we've seen that things that used to be adorable get a haircut and a shave, and now they're fugly. Ew. But any otherwise horrible thing can be lovable if it has more hair. Anyway, maybe you still don't want to accept your relationship to these things. But if you have a heel in your foot, and your whole jaw is made of one dentary bone, and if you can't t push your tongue out through your nostrils because of that secondary palate, then do you accept that these, in concert with all your other traits listed thus far, make you a cynodont? And despite what H.P. Lovecraft may have said about this, you understand that you don't have a pineal eye, right? Do you understand that because the teeth in front of your canines are different than the teeth behind your canines, that this puts you in the higher classification, as does your thoracic ribs, abdominal diaphragm, and higher metabolism? Some of you even have hair. So if you really want to feel warm and fluffy, remember, you're not just a cynodont. You're an epic cynodont. Cynodont.